The Terminator series is probably one of the best known sci-fi franchises. Over its lifetime it's raised over three billion dollars. That's more than twice the nominal GDP of St. Lucia. Thanks for that, Wikipedia. It features not only five films, but also comic books, TV series, video games, toys, and other merchandise. It's about an AI called Skynet, which becomes self-aware and decides to destroy humanity, and the various efforts, often focusing on time travel, to stop this happening. Here I'm just looking at the films, and how they have inevitably changed over the 31 years the Quintology has existed. And they've changed a lot. So let's start with the first film, The Terminator. Interesting to note, it's the only film in the series with the at the beginning. Is that interesting to note? Do people care? The Terminator was made in 1984, and is about a cyborg sent from the future to that year, tasked with killing the mother of the not yet conceived leader of the human resistance, fighting against Skynet, a very unfriendly artificial intelligence. At the same time, Kyle Reese, a soldier from the future, is sent back by the resistance to stop this cyborg, a Terminator, played by Arnold Schwarzenegger, a metal skeleton coated with real skin, free from morality, fatigue and body hair. James Cameron, the director, came up with the idea several years before the film was made, after having a dream about something we would now recognise as a Terminator. I remember reading once that it was also based on a story by Harlan Ellison, the science fiction writer, and I remember thinking, well it must be I have no mouth and I must scream. That's a short story about a malevolent AI that's purged the world of all humanity, apart from a handful of survivors that it tortures for its own amusement. In fact, it's not that at all. Harlan Ellison thought that The Terminator was a rip-off of an episode of Outer Limits he'd written in 1964, based on a prior story he'd written in 1957. The episode is about two soldiers, 1800 years in the future, who accidentally get sent back in time. Carlo, this is my wife, Abby. Uh, my daughter, Tony, and Lauren is the... is... I don't know why James Cameron bothered making Terminator if he wasn't going to change anything. Anyway, Cameron always refuted that he'd plagiarised Ellison. But Ellison and Orion Pictures settled out of court, and Harlan Ellison's name appears on later prints of the film. Whether Ellison was right, or it was just that the existence of two films about time-travelling killing machines in the same universe wasn't totally out of the realms of coincidence, I will leave up to you. But there is a difference between being legitimately inspired by something and just ripping something off. Also, buy my new book on Amazon, Pulp Novella. Anyway, The Terminator. Brad Feidel did the music and it was his first feature film. And boy did he bring the thunder. Although Cameron initially wanted Dick Smith for the special effects, who incidentally won an Oscar in the year Terminator was released with Paul LeBlanc for Best Makeup for his work in Amadeus, Smith didn't want to do it, but pointed to Stan Winston, who had worked with SFX genius Rob Bottin in The Thing, where he created the dog monster. Although he was already well known in Hollywood, it was the Terminator that made Winston's name, and with good cause. Sure, some of the models may seem remedial, but it really works, and the design of the Terminator is terror-inducing. For the Terminator, Cameron considered Mel Gibson and Sylvester Stallone. Imagine Mel Gibson as the Terminator. I'll be back! Because he sounds like that. OJ Simpson was even on the cards, but Cameron didn't think he'd be a believable killer. Or not one beyond reasonable doubt. Arnold Schwarzenegger was first considered as Reese, but after meeting him, Cameron knew that he had to play the Terminator. Maybe not believable as an infiltration unit, Arnold certainly brought menace. One of the things I really like about the first movie is that Schwarzenegger isn't cool. He isn't trying to be cool. He comes off like a creep. But he also comes off like the type of creep that really won't stop until you crush him into bits in an industrial press. You know, the sort of creep that went out with your big sister when she was 17. My point is, he doesn't look cool, he looks freaking crazy. Nice night for a walk. Although it wasn't expected to be a blockbuster, and it sure wasn't expected to spawn such a successful franchise, The Terminator had all the right elements there. It's often understated and gritty. Can 
hear it now. He's gonna be called a goddamn phone book killer. I hate these first cases. It's also completely over the top, and most of the time it takes itself quite seriously. Maybe 95% seriously. And it really builds both the tension and the idea that the future is a total nightmare. And that's important because that's something that does change throughout the series. The future in The Terminator is one where humankind is on the very precipice of annihilation. Kyle Reese may speak of Skynet's imminent defeat, but it will take centuries to rebuild. There has, after all, been a global nuclear war followed by a systematic holocaust. It's not fun, it's bleak. And to alleviate that, here's some people dancing in the most 80s scene ever committed to tape. Yeah, Tech Noir, that's Shatner's sequel that was never published. Tech War is still a thing. Now the Terminator and its sequel, Terminator 2, Judgment Day, are very different, not just in content, but also in tone. Judgment Day features Arnie, back again as the Type 101, this time reprogrammed by a grown-up John Connor to protect little John Connor from the Terminator sent back by Skynet, the liquid metal T-1000, played by Robert Patrick. So it's the same thing, but instead of Sarah Connor, it's JC, played by Edward Furlong. And instead of Carl Reese, it's Arnie. And instead of Arnie, it's Robert Patrick. What? Get down. <laughs> Terminator 2 was originally Cameron's idea for the first Terminator, but he felt a liquid metal Terminator couldn't sufficiently be created by special effects of 1984. Now, if ever you want to argue that CGI has a place in film, I think Terminator 2 is your prime example of when it works. From what I can tell, Terminator 2 is most people's favourite. For me, it's Terminator 1, but that's because it contains what I like. It's an ultra-violent, no-nonsense thriller about a bulletproof man who drives a truck through the window of a police station. That's my perfect film. But I am willing to accept that Terminator 2 is the better film. And it really is. And it's for a reason that its successors were never able to replicate. In Terminator 2, a large part of the movie is young John Connor bonding with the T-101, trying to teach its stuff, learning from it too. It kind of feels sappy at first, like they've just put a kid in there as a gimmick, and maybe it is a gimmick, but it allows us as an audience to bond with Arnie, to bond with that robot. It allows us as an audience, through the interactions of the Terminator and John Connor, to really become attached to him, to really sympathise with him. It's kind of a masterstroke that the the guy you really want to live, the guy you're really rooting for, isn't the kid. It isn't the kick-ass rebirth Sarah Connor. It's the bad guy from the first film. Not only that, he is a machine incapable of human emotions. Yet his lack of rage or hatred and coolness through pressure win us over. The film, of course, is much more polished. They weren't putting out a little film about a robot from the future. They were putting out a blockbuster and they expected it to deliver. And it did. Stan Winston was back doing the practical effects, and Industrial Light and Magic did the cutting-edge CGI work, which although obviously dated, still holds up. One thing that didn't change was Cameron's vision of the future. It remained totally bleak, and certainly made the war with Skynet look desperate tooth and nail stuff, where nothing was safe and no one was especially expected to come back from patrol. A key difference from the first film, however, is its humour. I swear I will not kill anyone. Holy shit. I need a vacation. It's subtle, but it's there. It never goes over the top, but it stops the film becoming silly, which it might have become if it was presented in total earnest. I also think it's worth mentioning Robert Patrick specifically, because he is by far the most menacing antagonist in the series. Arnie in the first film was very mean and had real presence, but in Terminator 2, Patrick is frighteningly efficient, manipulative, fearless, and cool as fuck on that motorbike. Fiedler's score contributes to this no end. Now the Terminator took itself pretty seriously and was far more adult than its immediate successor. And I mean that in the sense that the Terminator is a lot meaner. It's ultra violent. Although people die in Terminator 2, it's nowhere near as nasty. The violence is a little more palatable, although it does have its dark parts, especially where it depicts the future. Also, this. 
if us the parents are dead. Hey Timmy, cheer up. Things can always be worse. Sure, you never knew your father, your mother's in a mental hospital, but, case in point, your foster parents are dead. It should be horrific, but it's kind of funny. And that's why Terminator 2 has, and will continue to have, a very broad appeal. Now Terminator 2, made on $102 million, was the most expensive film ever made, when it was made. The same is true of Terminator 3, Rise of the Machines, which cost just under $190 million, being released in 2003. Terminator 3 Rise of the Machines hams the series the hell up. Arnie is another T-101 sent back to protect young adult, now young adult, John Connor and his future lieutenants in the resistance against Skynet. He's protecting them or trying to protect them from the TX, played by Kristana Loken who I think has even less lines here than Arnie does in the first movie. She does like Lexus though. Lexus? Lexi? Lexi. Are you okay? Do you want me to call 911? I like this car. Uh, what are you well, I don't blame her. It is the Japanese Mercedes. Arnie goes to a bar and wears stripper clothes and Elton John sunglasses. He tells someone to talk to the hand. Talk to the hand. He tells someone to relax. 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 He gets lifted up by his titanium alloy hulies. He lies. You, you said that you'd let me go. I lied. He fights a corrupted program, very much like David Hedison in The Fly. In short, it's silly and it's tongue-in-cheek. It's far more self-referential and playful than Terminator 2. But it doesn't descend into self-parody. Also, there's this. Your fiance is dead. Yeah, the world's going to be destroyed in 15 hours and fate demands that you get with this guy who's all weird and greasy and you don't know and haven't seen for 10 years, but it could be worse. Case in point, your fiance is dead. Notice, of course, Linda Hamilton isn't back. At the time the film was released, director Jonathan Mostow said that Cameron had written her out in an early draft. Quite simply, that isn't true. Linda Hamilton just didn't want to be in it. And despite what Mostow and the studio might have said about replacing Edward Furlong as John Connor because it's a different John Connor, Edward Furlong, without being nasty, was just too fucked up. A real shame because I think as a young man, he was a really good actor. Schwarzenegger does reprise his role though, and as ever, he is the linchpin. He's what we're interested in and what we watch. Despite being hammy though, the film continues to present the future as a diabolical nightmare. I actually thought the beginning of Terminator 3 was the moodiest and the way John Connor talks, he's obviously haunted by visions of a maybe or maybe not impending hell. Otherwise, it's a similar affair, essentially boiled down to a long chase scene, but very enjoyable all the same. Kristana Loken is nowhere near as interesting an antagonist as Arnie or Robert Patrick and the set pieces seem nowhere near as magnificent as the ones in Terminator 2 still do today. I can't help but feel that this would have been a much better film with James Cameron at the helm, but at the same time that he was right to turn it down. Don't get me wrong, it works and I like it. It just seems like a familiar blade that's lost its edge. In terms of changes, T3 is a lot like T2. It's got the same amount of characters doing pretty much the same things. But one thing I do really like about it is its end. Like Terminator 2, John Connor, and this time Kate Brewster, rather than his mom, aim to smash Skynet before it comes online. But, and here's the critical spoiler if you've not seen it but are still listening, they're tricked by Arnie into taking shelter in a fallout bunker as Skynet launches its attack. That bloody Terminator! I never really thought that the destruction of Cyberdyne in the second film would destroy Skynet. I always kind of subscribed to the idea that the war was inevitable, because if war didn't happen, no one would be sent back, so Sarah Connor wouldn't know to destroy Cyberdyne, so... So yeah, I like the conclusion of Terminator 3. It avoids an easy, happy ending, and also avoids the sentimentality at the end of Terminator 2. Terminator 4. Terminator Salvation. It's the sort of movie that, if it hadn't been called Terminator, you could watch 70 minutes of, and then suddenly explode out the exclamation, I've seen this before! It's very different from the first three movies, almost to the point where it's unrecognisable. And I'd like to say that the main difference is Arnold Schwarzenegger isn't present, apart from a not quite good looking enough CGI rendering of him. But to be honest, there's so much. It's set in the present, time travel has no part in it, it's not a chase movie. It's an action war adventure movie set in the apocalypse. 
The main change as I see it is that the first three Terminator movies have, on some level, been horrors. They weren't scary, but they use well-established horror tropes and ways of suggesting threat used in horror. They were about running away from an unstoppable killer that can't be reasoned with. They were about being outclassed, the prey to a predator. That's what made them exciting. Even with Arnie protecting John Connor, how are you going to defeat a liquid Terminator? How do you beat that? Terminator Salvation is about John Connor trying to find Kyle Reese, the man who fathers him when he's sent back to 1984. At the same time, Marcus, played by Sam Worthington, wakes up after apparently being put to death before the war, befriends Kyle Reese, and then goes looking for him, bumping into John Connor on the way, before being revealed as an unaware Terminator and ultimately turning on Skynet. At first, Salvation's vision of the future seems synonymous with Cameron's. It's bleak, it's ravaged by Terminators, there seems to be little hope. But quickly it establishes itself as a bit of a cosy catastrophe. That term really means people who survive the near total destruction of the human race and then live free of civilization and without much hardship. And that isn't what's going on here, but the nightmare doesn't quite live up to what we were promised. It may be a nitpick, but there's so many shots of people at night next to a fire or a lamp. Small thing, yes, but if Terminators were really hunting down the last remnants of the human race, I think you should turn the lights off and hide. Cameron's future was one where people lived underground, had to eat rats, and presumably were in a constant state of guerrilla warfare, retreat, and abandonment. That doesn't seem to be the case here. The humans have an established base. They seem to have air superiority in certain territory. There seems, too, to be a front line. The cities are in ruins, but there's no mention of radiation. The people aren't malnourished wrecks, and the machines seem all too defeatable. The threat of Terminators is greatly diminished in this film. Many times we see humans gunning them down, whereas it was established that regular munitions aren't good enough earlier in the series. Another major difference between Salvation and Terminators 2 and 3 is Salvation is almost entirely humorless, although I did enjoy Terry Crews in the shortest cameo ever filmed. Connor, get those men to respond! Olsen, something's wrong up here. His scenes were cut, but spotting him brought a smile to my face. I mean, come on, it would have been a better film if Terry Crews was in it. That's almost true of every film. Now, as I mentioned before, there are constant references to Terminators and Skynet, but it feels as though the names could have just been changed from any generic robot versus humans in the future script. There's no antagonist other than Skynet, which until we meet it, is faceless. Helena Bonham Carter had to cut her role as the face of Skynet short because of a family tragedy. But even then, Skynet is meant to be a machine, an AI that is self-aware but doesn't have feelings. I kind of think the threat from Skynet would have been far greater if we never met it, and I think this film would have been served far better if it had a consistent antagonist. One moment I want to point out in Salvation is when Blair, an ancillary character, and Marcus are walking along the wasteland. Blair starts to strip and then is confronted by three guys. It's heavily implied they're going to rape her. She fights back, they overpower her, then Marcus comes and together they kill the three attackers. Then afterwards, in the same place where all this happened, Blair cuddles up to Marcus as if nothing ever happened. As if an attempted gang rape never happened. I bring this up because I don't think this was intentionally offensive or anything like that. I think it was just thoughtless. And that's what McGee, the director, brought to this series. An enjoyable but thoughtless entry. Terminator Genesis, the fifth installment, goes back to the series' roots quite literally by opening in the future where John Connor and Carl Reese defeat Skynet, but do so just after it sends a Terminator back to kill Sarah Connor. So we get very well done recreations of the original Terminator with new actors. To me, when I watched this, I thought, okay, this looks pretty interesting. Young Too Much Botox Arnie goes to undress the punks from the first film, but is stopped by the first Arnie, or old Arnie. Meanwhile, new Carl Reese, played by Jai Courtney, runs away from the cops and is then confronted by the T-1000? Honestly, explaining the plot would be quite difficult, and you'd probably be just as well to look at what I said for Terminator 1, 2, and 3 in random two-second sound bites. Like many films that play with time, things get complicated pretty fast. Essentially, Arnie is old now because this is a different timeline where he was sent back to protect Sarah Connor when she was nine, and stayed with her ever since. I always thought that Arnie should have stayed around at the end of Terminator 2. I'm not going there. It's heavily referential to the first two movies, and the first half feels pretty respectful in its own way. But there's two main differences between this and the other films. 
Firstly, like Terminator 3, it's very hammy. You named it? Hello, calories. It is nice to meet you. But then it kind of really goes over the top, and it's hard for the narrative to build any tension. Fight me. That is a very immature response. Goddamn time traveling robots covering up their goddamn tracks. Can you just not say the word mate to me again, like, ever? Then you die. You can't kill us. We're your parents. What are these for? I use them to find my keys. There are enough bullets in the world to kill me. John Connor talks too much. Again, small moment, but look at what happens when Reese, Sarah, and Arnie get busted. Get down! What are you going to do when they come for you? I don't know. This leads me to the second critical difference. The film doesn't start as one, but by the second half, it's a parody of its predecessors. The constant out of context callbacks and the very apparent self-awareness makes it seem like it's based on fan fiction. It's not that I hate it, I don't hate it, I think it's fun, but it really does feel like it's one step above Arnie saying something square and Amelia Clark looking at the camera and saying, Terminators. Alan Taylor directed Genesis, but in all honesty it feels like several people did, without much collusion. While it recreates the look of shots from 1984, it doesn't really even attempt to create the dread. It doesn't create an ominous situation or brutal antagonist. And it ends in a saccharine way, not comparable to Terminator 2, which focuses on necessary sacrifice, but in a way that feels as if it was meant to close the series with a nice happy ending. That of course is itself undermined by the postscript. Genesis is the second highest grossing film of the series, after Terminator 2. It made $440 million from its theatrical release, which is a lot, but it's still $10 million shy of breaking even, putting a sequel in jeopardy. Now if you ask me, there will be a sequel in the next 10 years, if I had to bet, but I think a lot of that depends on whether Arnie wants to do another one or not. That really would sink or float the idea. I do think there will be another one, but I think it will be quite difficult to get made. What will it be like? Well, God knows. Frankly, Terminator 4 and Terminator 5 were so different from Cameron's films, and from each other, that it could go anywhere, if indeed it does happen. The series has moved from an at least somewhat serious 1980s ultra-violent movie that could have easily become an obscure title, to the blockbuster and playful second movie, the blockbuster and hammy third, the departure of the humorless and conventional fourth, to the humorous and unconventionally conventional fifth. Thanks for joining me. I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like, comment, share, download, explode, implode, upload, and subscribe.